Hello, uh, welcome everyone for our webinar. Uh, I'm Maria, I'm going to be the moderator for today. Uh, I'm also going to be the point of contact. Uh, so my email is going to be in the chat box uh, and to me after this session, if you still have any questions. Uh, we would like to share with you that given the number of people joining, we had to turn off your microphones. Uh, but we really want this to be an interactive webinar. Uh, I'll be in the chat box during the entire session, so feel free to ask some uh, questions or to share insights and uh, also to share where you are from. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll end with a Q&A session. So if you have bigger topics to cover and you really want a, um, a nice answer from our colleagues, please leave these questions uh, until the end. You'll also be needing to type them and my colleagues will get back to you. Um, another thing, I will. this uh, webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, so in a couple of days, I'm going to share with you all uh, the recording, but also the presentations uh, of our keynote uh, lectures. Um, about the agenda, we'll uh, start with an introduction to our program uh, with a special focus on the water, food and energy and water resource and, and ecosystem tracks by Charlotte de Freiture, Professor of Land and Water Development. After that, we'll have two keynote lectures by Hadil Hoshni, lecturer uh, in wastewater treatment for reuse in industry and agriculture, and Leonardo Alfonso, associate professor of hydroinformatics. After that, we'll have the Q&A session where um, my colleagues will be joining, but also Enica Mellis, uh, who is the coordinator of fellowships and admissions office. Uh, this is the second uh, winners. Uh, the other one covered other tracks. Um, of our masters. Uh, so I will also be sharing with you the recording of our previous webinar if you were not able to join. Um, and I think this is it. Uh, Charlotte, uh, feel free to start uh, the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to see so many people. Uh, let me start by sharing my, uh, my screen. Uh, you have to say whether you see it. Yes, we see it. All right, that's great. Let me get this in the, oh, yep. All right, well, uh, let me introduce to you the MSc in Water and Sustainable uh, Development. Uh, I'm actually quite proud to, to be able to present this to you. I think it's a beautiful program. But before we start uh, with our program, I would like to say a few words why you should come to IHG Delft and why this is such a unique uh, institute. Okay, so so first we are, uh, well, one of the very few or maybe even the only independent graduate school in the world that specializes in all water disciplines. And if I say all water disciplines, I mean literally all water disciplines, like, like from social sciences, technical sciences, sanitation, uh, water and diplomacy, governance, etc. Uh, we have uh, world-class lecturers and professors. Uh, you can look them up in the, on the website, and if you Google them, uh, you will see that, they're, that we are fortunate to have such a great lecturers and professors. Uh, we, uh, well, we, we encourage uh, the peer learning, and we are in a truly international environment. If we, per year, we have some like 60 or 70, na 70 uh, nationalities. So, so that's, that's really, and, and they're coming from literally all over the place. So, so that's a really nice uh, international environment. And what that does, I mean, that leads to a membership of, of a very big global water alumni network. So, so you don't only learn like the topic, uh, topic matter, but also you learn a lot or learn to know a lot of interesting people and, and you will be part of that alumni network. Now we have two masters of science. One is the one year master, so a regular master for water professionals who seek a science-based uh, MSc degree that's anchored in professional practice. And then we have a research master with the emphasis on research skills. And, and those are really geared toward people who would like to uh, um, um, pursue a, a PhD or at least a career in academics. Now we have a few key principles of the program. One, of course, it's problem oriented based on actual water related challenges. So it's, it's not purely academic, but we also have like a, a link to practice. 
Uh, it's a multidisciplinary uh, degree, uh, and and we of course we encourage like interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, it's it's active learning, so so we really encourage uh, students to to be uh, an active uh, part in in the classroom with all kind of activities, experience, uh, assignments, etc. Uh, we don't only look at the knowledge, but also on the competences, like like personal, interpersonal, and cognitive competences. And lastly, but absolutely not least, I think we are very student oriented, and we uh, have customized study trajectories. And and how that works, I I would like to show you now. Uh, so we have a lot of different topic uh, topics, uh, and and we call those modules. And uh, uh, we have divided those modules into different thematic tracks. So you have water hazards, risk, and climate. You have a thematic track on water and health. We have a thematic track on water, food, and energy. And we have a thematic track on water resources and ecosystems health. Now, how does that work? Uh, uh, and within those uh, thematic tracks, we have then Pro, what we call profiles, like an engineering profile, digital innovation profile, a governance and um, management profile, and an environmental profile. So, so within those thematic tracks, we basically subdivide them into uh, disciplinary profiles. How does that work? Say, if you have an example, right? If you if you are inter if you have a background in agriculture engineering, let's say, and you have an interest in engineering solutions for sustainable water development uh, management for food and energy security in an insecure world, for example, it will is that you basically start in a thematic track of water, food, and energy. So first, you have an introductory. Uh, uh, module uh, in the in the theme, and then you can start selecting um, your uh, the, the modules that, that best fit uh, uh, with your career path and your ambitions. So for example, you could uh, choose water crop and pro pro uh, no, sorry water and crop production. Uh, then you choose another one, let's say assessing irrigation performance. You choose another uh, irrigation design and modernization, hydraulic design of structures, and then lastly, dams and hydropower. So you see that in this particular example, you choose, you stayed within the engineering profile and uh, within the thematic track of water and food and energy. Now, say you have an interest in address, uh, addressing integrated basin uh, management uh, challenges while safeguarding ecosystem services, right? You have a, a slightly different profile. You have slightly different ambitions. Say you have a background in hydrology or in ecology. So you would obviously then choose a different thematic track. Let's say you choose the water resources, the ecosystem's health. So again, you start with the introduction to the theme. You choose uh, a, a topic like hydrology and ecosystems. You can choose then river basin modeling. You can choose a topic like bio uh, ecology, aquatic ecology and bioassessment, river and floodplain rehabilitation and hydrological modeling. So, so this would be another example of a, a a series, a trajectory of uh, in your study, and you see you have different. Uh, um, disciplinary profiles. You combine engineering with environment, with some interdisciplinary uh, topics, etc. So you basically follow a interdisciplinary profile within the thematic track. Of course, you can also in water resources and ecosystem health. You can also do a purely engineering or purely uh, environmental track. So, uh, oh, so sorry. Uh, say say you 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 uh, are a a student with a background in environmental sciences and and agriculture and or agriculture, but you have an interest in developing sustainable water resources management solutions with focus on ecosystems that produce food. Let's say uh, um, uh, wetlands or or or, or some other uh, ecosystems that that potentially produce food. So you start in the thematic track of water resources and ecosystem health. 
again with the introduction of the water resources uh, in the, into the theme. Again, you may choose a, a topic like hydrology and ecosystems, but then you start uh, with a, a water quality assessment, and then you can go to another track, right? You can basically follow the environmental topics in a different track, like food systems uh, transformation, wetlands for livelihood and conservation, and water you reuse for agriculture. So, so what you do then is basically you follow an environmental profile, choosing environmental topics, uh, but then uh, actually transcending or switching between the different tracks. So, so your, your red thread is basically the environmental profile. So in this way, there's, you can see that there's, there's many, many different possibilities of, of choosing your own path. Now, it's not only that we have, uh, uh, of course, the, our, our topics and, and our classes, but we also have an MSc research. And we do uh, see that, um, of course, it's difficult to, or difficult, some people may, well, may, may find it difficult to choose uh, and, and need, say, uh, uh, some guidance on so each student is assigned a coach. So once you are financially, academically and financially admitted, you get assigned a coach. And that coach will contact you and, and will support you in setting your own learning goals. And uh, along the way, you basically keep track of your own learning. So you assess your progress and you build a portfolio of, of things that you have learned. I already said we look also at transferable skills like academic and non-academic uh, skills. Um, so I already explained that you can have like a customized uh, profile depending on your learning goals and you, uh, um, you, you end your uh, education, your uh, MSc degree by an MSc thesis research which is, uh, consists of three months of research. And before you start that research, you have six weeks to write your proposal. So that's a, a good chunk is actually MSc research. Now I can explain about the mixed weeks in, in uh, so, so you have those, those topics, those modules interspersed with the different mixed weeks. And, and there you have like the skills development, which is, for example, working in groups, presentation skills, science communication skills, critical reading, debating skills, and scientific writing. So these are all part of, uh, of our curriculum as well, besides of all the, the topics that you follow. Now the research master is, is a, a two year program, as I said, this colorful picture, you see that the, that the orange is, is longer. It has more emphasis on uh, research and, and also it has a longer research period. In particular, in the second year, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, research uh, is, is dedicated. A lot of time is dedicated to doing your research. So, so you see that there is an overlap between the... the so, so basically you start together. Uh, in the two-year program, you start together up to uh, uh, the summer, uh, late summer, and then you split up uh, while the regular uh, students, the regular master students, they go to research uh, and the uh, two-year program. So the research master, they go into the different uh, research topics and, and spend a little bit a longer period on uh, re doing research. I think this is what I wanted to tell you about the Master of Science, or actually both Masters of Science in Water and Sustainable Development, and also the Research Master, of course, uh, of Science in, uh, in Water and Sustainable Development. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte. Everything was very clear, uh, as always. Um, uh, now we are going to have the first keynote lecture by Hadil Hoshni, uh, which is called uh, Revolution revolutionizing water and agriculture resources. So oh, thank you, Maria. Hi, everyone. Let me just start by checking if you can see my full screen. Yes. Can you see my full screen, please? OK, that's great. So good morning again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. 
my name is Hadid Hosni, and I'm happy to be with you here today in this webinar. So actually, our world faces critical challenges in ensuring sustainable access to water and optimizing agriculture productivity. But within these challenges lie immense opportunities for innovation and progress. Today, I would like to take you in a very short journey to explore the potential revolutions for water and agriculture resources. Let's just start by understanding the landscape of the global water resource. Actually, if we look closely into the supply and demand size of the global water resource, we find that globally, the total water supply amounts to 3,700 billion cubic meter per year. This includes surface water bodies, groundwater resource, and other freshwater reservoirs. If we look really on the breakdown for these resources, we find that 8% of the total water supply is allocated for the domestic purposes, including drinking, sanitation, and household needs, while 70% of the total water supply is utilized for agriculture activities, such as irrigation, crop cultivation, and livestock. 22% of the total water supply is allocated to industrial processes, manufacturing, and energy production, while only less than 1% of the total water supply is being lost through evapotranspiration. But if we look really about the actual demand, we found that it amounts to 4,600 billion cubic meter per year. That means that we have a total shortage of 900 billion cubic meter per year. In response to water shortages, there has been an increase on the intensity of water withdrawals, with, which really pushed the limits of sustainability. This trend is clearly depicted in a global overview of regions where water, uh, where water withdrawals exceed recharge rates, as you can see from this figure. According to the United Nations, when a country or a region withdraws 25% or more of its renewable freshwater resource, it considered as water-stressed country. When we analyze the global population trends and their implication for resources limitation, it becomes evident for everyone that the world's population size is experiencing a remarkable increase. According to the estimates and projection, the global water population has reached approximately 8.1 billion people as we uh, here 2024. Looking ahead, future projections suggest that the population size will continue to increase, while the growth rate itself may decrease. Emphasizing the importance of addressing resource limitations. So, to accommodate the needs of the growing population, we need to intensify our agricultural activities. So, agricultural activities have evolved to maximize productivity. This includes the use of irrigation system, fertilizers, and advanced farming techniques. While these practices has, have increased food production, they also require substantial amounts of water. The increased demand of water in agriculture intensifies the strain on water resource. Adding to these pressures, there is the climate change. Actually, the projected impacts of climate change on water resource are a cause for concern for everyone as we assess the future challenges we may face. Climate change is expected to bring about significant change to our hydrological systems, affecting water availability and increase the water-related risks. Some of, main, of, of the main consequences of climate change are increasing in temperature, shifts in precipitation patterns, increase the frequency of flooding and droughts. Next to these challenges and pressures in water resource come the digital revolution. The rapid advancement of the digital revolution and the growth of the industrial sector have also placed additional pressure on our already limited water resource. 
as we, re as we rely more on data centers, cloud computing, and technological infrastructure, the demand for water in these operations has increased significantly. And here, I just would like to present and show you one example that highlights the water consumption associated with digital services in the case of Google's data center. In 2023 only, alone, Google utilized over 5.6 billion gallons of water in its data center worldwide. And to simplify this, this is just equal and equivalent to 37 Gulf courses. If we look on and take really a comprehensive look at the various pressures on water resource, as we just mentioned, coming from unsustainable water withdrawal, global population, intensifying the agriculture activities, climate change, and digital revolutions, there is also beyond these factors, other significant contributors to the strain on water supplies. These like the transboundary water issues, where water source span multiple countries, add complexity and potential conflict to the management of water resource. Also the developments of biofuels, while touted as a renewable energy source, comes with a hefty water cost it takes between 1,000 to 4,000 liters of water to produce just one liter of biofilm. Additionally, the improvement in living standards, while positive in many respects, have increased water consumption. For example, a 10-minute shower can consume around 100 liter of water and just one pass can use up to 200 liters. And these pressures and factors are continuing and putting different layer of pressure on our limited, water, limited freshwater resource. So I think it is obvious for everyone that we need to revisionalize our water and agriculture resource. So the demand for revisionalizing the water and agriculture resource has never been more pressing, fortunately, Innovative solutions are emerging to address these challenges. Let's take some of them, like the Internet of Things, utilizing center, centers for monitoring and video solutions, along with remote sensing, enables real-time data collection and analysis, drones, robots play an important role in assessing crop quality and gross and optimizing accordingly our resources utilization. Also, the genetic and nuclear techniques offer a great opportunity to enhance crop resilience to weather extremes and diseases. They also contribute to increasing productivity while simultaneously reducing greenhouse emissions. Also, methods like soilless agriculture in greenhouses maximize crop yield per drop of water and kinetic controlled agriculture shortens cultivation time, improving efficiency, and contribute to, the to, to an optimum resource utilization. Next to these is the rain harvesting, which offers a sustainable alternative for water as, as water resource reducing the dependency on the traditional freshwater resource supplies. The desalination processes, which convert the seawater into freshwater, expand the water resource for agriculture use, especially in water scarce regions. Adding to this revisionality in water and agriculture resource is the reusing of treated wastewater in irrigated agriculture, which only not valorizing the each drop of water but also it contributes to reduce the green gas emissions by an average of 32% and also a good source for nutrients by recovering the nutrient and the treated wastewater, reducing the water footprint per crop and really a add a significant benefits to cope with these challenges. These examples illustrate the diverse and innovative approaches available to address the challenges facing our water and agriculture uh, agriculture resource. 
But please remember that these should be a tailor-made solution based on available data in each location to fit the purpose optimally. Not one practice or technique or, techne or technology would fit any country or any context. As we conclude our presentation, I would really love to leave you with this thought. Every journey begins Every journey begins with a single step. Each of you has the power to make a difference, to take the first step towards unlocking your potential and shaping a brighter future. Thank you for joining us on this webinar today. And let's take the first step together and make a positive impact on the world around us. Thank you so much, Adil. Uh... Leonardo, uh, now we have uh, his lecture, Real-Time Control for of uh, Water Systems by Leonardo Afonso. Uh, could you take the lead now? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me set up this, please. Please let me know if you see my screen. All right, very good. So good morning. Uh, good afternoon also for some of you. Uh, I will talk now a little bit about the topic of real-time control of water systems, which is part of one of our digital innovations modules in our Master in Water and Sustainable Development. But first, let me clarify something. You probably know these two persons, uh, but maybe what you probably don't know is their full names. So Lionel Messi is actually Cuccitini and Sofia Vergara. She has two names, Vergara. However, they have dropped their last names. And as I also want to be famous, then uh, I used to drop my second name as well. This is because, um, well, not because I want to become famous, because, but because uh, Alfonso is my, my last name, and this is sometimes a source of confusion. So anyway, so I'm going here to talk about uh, real-time control of water systems, which uh, is a digital innovation that uses sensors, models, algorithms, actuators, controllers, and um, optimization, among other technologies, to assist decision-making in our water systems. And the Netherlands is a great place to see this working. Uh, this is part of the Netherlands. Here you see Delft in the south part. Uh, you can also see Amsterdam somewhere up there and the North Sea here in the uh, left side. The city of The Hague is also around. And this map shows uh, the area that could be potentially flooded if the water is six meters below sea level. So basically what is happening now. However, uh, if the water is two meters below sea level, then the map will look like this. This is one meter below sea level. This is at sea level. You see Delft is now an island. And here is one meter above sea level. So you see, even, even, even if this happens, you will be safe in Delft because we will have still some island around. But the thing is, this is how uh, the area works. And for that, the, you know, it's a, it's a very complex water system, low lying in areas that the water level needs to be between minus six meters to 40 centimeters. Um, and these are many inlet independent water level areas that uh, has rapid runoff. And um, there are several pumping stations uh, that, that drain the water out of this area. 
you see some of them here. I think there, there are a couple of, of more uh, nowadays, but this is the idea. And uh, also there are about 120 polder pumping stations draining more uh, than uh, 60 polders. I, I'm going to, to talk about that in a moment. And also this famous structure is, is around here uh, that you may see, may have seen in, in, in TV or in documentaries. So this is the typical landscape uh, where lower uh, and smaller canals fit larger and higher canals. And as you can see, the water level in larger canals um, can also be much higher than even the infrastructure that is next to it. So cities are built like that. This uh, is the typical polder system. And this is basically uh, land that was reclaimed um, uh, uh, from the sea. And um, it is built to be drained constantly by means of various structures. And uh, for that, we use control theory. And control theory is the branch of engineering and mathematics that deals with the behavior of dynamic systems and how their behavior is modified by feedback. And uh, related topics are control engineering, control systems, automation, and others. Uh, so th this is a, a very big field. But here in this class, we concentrate on the application of basic control theory to water systems. And what's a water system? Well, it depends. These, these are different types. Water system can be natural water systems, so systems flowing freely without control. Uh, others are partly controlled. So this is, uh, in this case, a, a weir that is fixed and that has been built probably to store some water behind it. We have also partly controlled water systems, like in this case where we have uh, uh, yeah, hydroelectric uh, plants um, so that we can control how much water uh, it will flow through them depending on, on different aspects. Uh, this is uh, an example of almost fully controlled. And actually this is one of the pumps that uh, I, I was showing in the map uh, before. This is in the Netherlands. This is the North Sea. And uh, yeah, this is a pumping station. So it, it drains the water from inside to into the sea. And this, is, this was used to be one of our destinations to visit with the, with the, the groups. And we also have fully controlled water systems like uh, the piping systems, you know, pipes for water distribution or for drainage. Uh, these are uh, systems that we, we really have control on the water behavior there. So what is RTC, real-time control? Is control while the event is taking place. So there is an event and then we need to do something uh, about that. And that was by Schilling in 1990, but later uh, a former colleague here at IHE, uh, Associate Professor in Hydroinformatics, uh, Arnold Lobrecht, came up with this uh, the, um, definition that RTC is control on the basis of monitoring data. So we have here the, the very important first component data in which the time lag between measurement and control action is short in comparison to the response time of the control system. Maybe a little bit complicated to read and understand in one go, but let me give you uh, an example, a very simple example. Suppose we have a river system with a reservoir and an urban area downstream. So this is the reservoir and this is the urban area. And then we, uh, we also have a gate here. So we have a, uh, something that we can control. Suppose that a strong precipitation event happens upstream and su such uh, event would produce this uh, flood wave that will travel downstream and the peak is measured at the measurement point and this triggers the instruction to open a gate so that the excess water uh, can be safely stored in the reservoir protecting the urban area downstream. I will, I will repeat again uh, the animation and I'm not so sure if these animations are, can be seen very 
very good in, in this kind of seminars or webinars uh, because of the delay in the video, but let me try again. So the flood comes, it is measured and almost immediately the gate is open. Uh, so remember that uh, the time lag between the measurement and opening the gate is short compared to the time required for the water to flow into the reservoir. So this is what we mean by the definition of real-time control. So real-time control can be used for many things. Flood prevention is one of them, but not, is not, not the only one. We can also use it to, for draft prevention, for optimization of resources, for improving operational efficiency of, of the systems that we have in place, and in general, for optimizing capacity. And this is an alternative to infrastructural measures. Sometimes we tend to build bigger tanks, bigger pipes, bigger uh, uh, storage, uh, 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 yeah, let's say storage bodies. Sometimes that's not necessarily. It's just a matter of optimizing the capacity you have with real-time control. And for that, we need to consider different water management aspects because there are different uh, things that affect these decisions like common good interest, sectorial interest and operational interests, and they may, may be conflicting. So that's why we need to balance this uh, a little bit uh, when we define the objectives of the real-time control um, in, in our system. In the classroom, we see, we study actuators. So actuators are actually the devices or the hydraulic structures that you can use to change the behavior of, of the variables of interest in the water system. Uh, so with this, you can control discharge or water levels or water quality, et cetera. And uh, these, are, these are some examples, huh? the pumps, the gates, the weirs, the valves. In the classroom, we also um, see um, how we can operate these actuators. So we start with a very basic control scheme of open loops, and then we go as sophisticated as feedback feed forward control with some point optimization. Uh, and um, we, we go slowly, we increase this complexity slowly, and then we, we study the concept of control in this way. And also we teach the concepts of, uh, you know, that are behind basic controllers or algorithms to calculate the new operational state of these actuators. And modeling is in the heart of real-time control, uh, because if you see in the previous slide, uh, this more complex uh, scheme contains already a process model somewhere here. Uh, and that's why we need to talk about models. And model is a, a simplification of reality. And inside the models, we um, use, let's say we simplify reality. And in our case, that is this means mathematical models that describe the behavior of the water passing through these devices, through these actuators. And then we see how in the different modeling systems, this can be taken into account and how can uh, we uh, set up and configure this in the models. So some of the educational activities we do are of course lectures, some exercises, you need to make some calculations to use some modeling. We ask a lot of questions. You also, uh, present your own case study, you present your findings in groups. We have also a tutorial and a short visit. And in the visit, you normally go to, to a polder. You have to recognize all the elements of an RTC system. And by the way, these windmills are remarkably one of the most famous characteristics of the Netherlands. And that happens to be also an actuator. And uh, for example, this is an old windmill without the blades, but in fact, there is a big pumping station inside, which drains the water from the big low-lying uh, area that you see behind, this green area. Um, and also you see that we are all wet because uh, it uh, here in the Netherlands, it uh, rains very often. Actually, right now it's, it's raining. 
Um, so in these field visits, we sometimes get wet as well, but this is part of the experience. Uh, and, uh, you know, we study water from all perspectives possible. So finally, we bring uh, the classroom outside to visit these polders and see some actuators. And we do this by bike. And sometimes, you know, students don't know how to ride a bike. So I offer myself to, you know, at least take one because I cannot take more. So I kindly ask you to start preparing yourself. If you don't know how to ride a bike, you can start practicing now. And uh, this is uh, all from my side. I'm looking forward to see you in the classroom soon. Thank you so much. A uh, very nice way to finish your keynote lecture. Uh, we love the video. <laughs> um, well, uh, now we start the um, Q&A session. Um, Inika, I think the most of the questions uh, are for you. Uh, so I see a lot of questions uh, about uh, students that would like to join a PhD after and that wonder if this is the right uh, path uh, to go there. I think this one can be better be answered by uh, Charlotte. Charlotte or Leonardo. Yes, okay, so, so indeed, uh, so the best preparation for a PhD, if you want to pursue a PhD, is of course the two-year master. Um, but having said that, uh, there is uh, legally by, by law in the Netherlands, if you have an MSc, uh, whether that is one year, two years or five years or whatever, if you have an MSc, you are entitled to uh, for, for pursuing a, a, a PhD. But of course, I mean, in the two year master, you get uh, a, a better preparation because you get all kind of, uh, um, uh, well, uh, research topics, uh, scientific writing, doing literature review, uh, science, uh, critical thinking. So there's more and more emphasis on, uh, on, the, um, uh, on, on the research skills and the academic skills. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I saw also a question, Maria, if I may. I also saw a question of people saying, well, if I start a one year master, can I then flow to the two years master? Yes, that's indeed possible, but I, I do need to have some expectation management here. It's not automatic. It's not that you can uh, uh, very practically, if you have a scholarship, there may be limitations to your scholarship. If, if, the scholar, if your scholarship is given explicitly for a one year master or for the one year master, there may be um, uh, administrative reasons why you cannot use that same scholarship for switching to another master. But I think Ine can, can, can say a little bit more. She has more experience in that. But uh, and and also, of course, uh, we we do we do have some procedure for there uh, for that and and looking at basically your performance, but also more importantly, your motivation for switching from one year to a two year master, and of course, you need to have the funding to do that, and and that is also a. Uh, but this year there are a few people who basically switch from the one to the two year master. Uh, so I also have another question. I think this one would be for you. Uh, is it possible to do modules across all tracks? Uh, yes, it is possible to do modules across all tracks. And in particular, if you're following a, uh, a a certain profile, a certain disciplinary profile, like for example, Leonardo, Leonardo gave a, a very nice presentation about the digital uh, innovation. Uh, and, and so there's different uh, topics, different modules across the tracks that, that are basically addressing uh, digital innovations with different applications or different types. So yes, you you're in, in principle you're free to choose any module that you like except and again a little bit of of expectation management it's not completely free of course you need to have the prerequisites to do that uh, so so for example uh, if, if you want to do a a very technical engineering module then of course you need some uh, background uh, that like in engineering or some other technical topic um, and so that's a prerequisite. And of course, it's it's you need to have some rationale in your trajectory. It needs to kind of be um, related to your learning goals and your um, your your career goals. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also another question: uh, uh, How is the connection between class and the industry like? Uh, could you also cover this, uh, Charlotte? Uh, yeah, I can do that, but maybe Leo can also do, Le Leonardo can also do that. Uh, we have different, by module, we have different uh, excursions 
And uh, we also have guest lecturers that uh, actually from the industry that, that come and, and teach in our classes. Uh, but maybe, maybe Leonardo can also say a little bit about how, how in his topic, uh, how he does that. Uh, so are, are we talking about, I'm sorry, I was a bit distracted. We're we talking about um, the, field, connection, field visits? Uh, the connection between class and the industry. Oh, yes. Um, indeed, by means of uh, guest lectures mainly. Uh, so in our classroom, uh, we invite people from, for example, uh, water distribution, um, like Dunea water or Vitens. Uh, these experts that explain uh, how uh, water works here. Um, and in, in different modules, we have also uh, other persons talking about uh, their uh, consultancy projects and, uh, you know, that relate very much to the content of the course that we explain. So, uh, yeah, I think I can, I can say, uh, well, maybe also we can say that uh, um, sometimes in, during the research part, the thesis, uh, sometimes we we also uh, encourage the participation of uh, external supervisors that are from kind of companies, uh, and and that also provides uh, a good connection to to industry in general. Okay. Not only in the Netherlands, but also elsewhere. So there is also a question related to the, the, this. Uh, does the course uh, has industry internship to gain hands-on experience? Uh, but I think uh, you kind of answer this way. Uh, uh, um, well, I I would say that this this can exist, but this is not the main. Um, it's not the most common part. Let's say uh, sometimes example. because that depends on 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 funding uh, and also if the industry is uh, uh, able to take the students. Um, okay, yeah. all right, thank you so much. Uh, maybe, maybe if I may, in, in the, the master uh, uh, research, the research phase uh, in, in both masters, uh, there there is a, indeed a, sometimes a connection with the industry so that the industry or some company uh, is asking to do certain kind of research and that is then in uh, in collaboration with, with that uh, particular company. Um, now I have another, I, I saw several questions about these, uh, which is about their background. Uh, what are we searching for in, in terms of students? Uh, we welcome uh, students from different backgrounds, right? Uh, but uh, Charlotte Inka, who wants to, to join uh, in this answer, but maybe you could uh, speak a bit about this. Uh, yeah, I can I can say so. So we we're looking for water professionals who who are looking for a uh, a boost in their careers or or a uh, sometimes we also have students who have a, a slightly different background, but they would love to kind of uh, gear and go towards uh, the water sector. So so I think the number one is is motivated student, active students. But also interest in in all kind of water uh, water issues, uh, and and of course I mean the the formal um, uh, let's say the the, the formal um, the requirement admission requirements. I think Ineke can say something about it. Um, but but yeah, so so those are the those are basically the to me um, the the most. Uh, important features let's say so motivation but also willing to to look a little bit further to be exposed to to other uh water topics other uh people around people from the industry but also from uh, governments for ngos uh, mm -hmm. and basically people who are willing to make an impact in the water sector in their particular countries thank you uh, then Inika, maybe you can talk a bit about the formal background, because from what I understand, it's not uh, just people that uh, studied engineering, uh, but also uh, social science is possible. Yes, yeah, you find all the admission and the criteria in detail on the website. So for the different tracks, it's indicated which uh, bachelor would be most suitable. Uh, but then it's also possible, even if your uh, background is not mentioned there, it may be possible that you uh, can be admitted. But in those cases, most probably you will be advised to study some uh, preparatory courses. You can find them on our open courseware and also 
after uh, an applicant has gained admission and financial um, admission also, he will have this meeting with the coach who will then advise this applicant which uh, preparatory course is best to follow. And Thank also, you. yeah, if if you if an applicant does not have a suitable bachelor background but is already working in the water field, then that's also a, a good possibility that the applicant can be admitted. We do ask a minimum uh, bachelor GPA, and that's around uh, B B plus uh, according to the U.S. system or um, seventy uh, second uh, upper according to the British uh, system. And per country, we have a list with um, what's the minimum requirement for country. Uh, okay, uh, now I have another question. Uh, Hadil mentioned uh, in the presentation about how the solutions are region specific. Uh, the question is, do we get uh, to experience that in class, uh, looking at example of region specific solutions? Yes, thank you for the question. Yes, indeed. Uh, usually we have a real case studies from different regions uh, with a special focus on global south as well that uh, are suffering uh, from uh, a serious uh, water shortages and also food insufficiency. So, for instance, for the module of wastewater treatment and reuse in agriculture, we have case studies from India, from Egypt, uh, from Iraq, uh, from Jordan as well. And sometimes we compare uh, the case study from Global South or from low and middle income countries with some developed countries, take some numbers and figures uh, from the Netherlands or from Belgium. And we do field trip uh, here in the Netherlands or Belgium related and start to make a pinch parking between uh, the developed uh, and the low and uh, middle income countries. So we do have real case studies with real figures numbers. So we do a lot of projects in these countries and we use the data and findings for our students to practice and to see the real situation. All right, uh, and another question related to this, do I get to design my research tailored towards addressing problems in my home country? Yes, you can, for sure, you, you can do it. So we have two options. Uh, our colleagues here at IHE offer several topics according to, uh, to their expertise but also you have the option to propose your own topic from your home country and uh, um, match with the mentor and supervisor in, in the related discipline. Yeah, for sure you can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Inika, uh, now we go back to you uh, because we have uh, several questions about scholarships. Uh, maybe you can go over the scholarships that are still available uh, for the upcoming uh, academic year. Yeah, there are still scholarships uh, available uh, from the Water Development Partnership Program. And uh, these are for a certain number of countries. So Horn of Africa, Sahel, uh, Middle East. I'm going to post the link yeah, for that scholarship. So, and okay. for uh, small island development states countries. So you don't have to not have to apply separately for the scholarship. So you do have to apply for academic admission and pay uh, attention to your application that you uh, really look. It's good, you upload all the documents, have a good CV and uh, a strong motivation. And then uh, we will, uh, the deadline is the 1st of uh, June and we'll expect the, uh, the outcome in July. And then we have still a scholarship for Latin American students. These are partial scholarships, cover 50% of the cost. Um, that's only for sanitary engineering and uh, sanitation uh, background. And we do still have IHE partial scholarships, uh, hardship scholarships cover 25% um, of the reduction, uh, the tuition fee. And uh, what are uh, leader scholarship for the regular master and what a top scientist scholarship for the research master? They give a reduction of 40% on the tuition fee. The information is all uh, on the website. And beside these scholarships, it's, it's also advisable because you, we noticed that some students only apply after they see that they are scholarships on, on our website, but this is not, this is just what IAT knows of, but there will be more opportunities. Applicants are also advised to search themselves. And yeah, first step is always for a sponsor that you have an academic admission. So the advice is always do apply for academic admission because 
also throughout the years, they may may come different options available for scholarships, which at this moment we do not know of. And then we wish check in our database of admitted applicants. Okay, I, I've just posted the link of the scholarships, so you can all uh, see there the scholarships that are still available. I see that some uh, potential students are having difficulties in applying for some scholarships because, because those are closed already. So uh, the only open scholarships that uh, are still running are the ones that Inika just mentioned. Uh, maybe they will open uh, for uh, the next round, uh, the other ones. Um, I also see some questions about the English test. Uh, could you go over it a bit, uh, Inika? Yeah, maybe you can uh, put the link also of the English yeah. requirements. Uh, but um, the, um, yeah, the, there are certain tests which we accept. And there are, for some countries, there are exceptions. But if your country is not mentioned there, then you're it it you it cannot be exempted. So an English test is required. The IELTS test is the most common one for the regular. A master require a score of six for the total and a six for the writing part, and for the research master is a six and a half for the total and the writing part. These are the tests which are most commonly used. There are some others which are also mentioned on the website, but we do not accept a, a statement of a university uh, that uh, the bachelor was in English, only for the countries which are on the exception, exemption list. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another uh, question about accommodation. Uh, so I think everyone knows that it's hard to get an accommodation in the Netherlands. How it is in Delft? Uh, do you have any particular uh, suggestions? Do you have an accommodation system, Menika? We do have our, our own student accommodation. So this is, uh, yeah, compared to other universities, this is, uh, of course, a big advantage. So uh, IHE offers uh, student accommodation. So once a student has financially been uh, admitted, they will receive uh, information about it and can make a reservation. Accommodation, though, is expensive. That's that's in the whole of the Netherlands. It's a it's a problem to find accommodation. But the big advantage of IHE is that we have our own student accommodation. Okay, thank you, uh, Charlotte. Uh, how well would uh, you say that this program is tailored for entrepreneurship in water sector? I well, it, of course, it depends on the on the topics and the modules that you will choose. But but I think if you, as I say, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility. And uh, so if you choose your topics and your modules well, I think this is well suited for, for entrepreneurship. So if you uh, look more at the topics of, let's say, financial management or entrepreneurship, uh, maybe techno it depends, of course, in, in which kind of entrepreneurship you're, you're thinking of. But I think there's, there's enough scope for choosing the modules in such a way that, that indeed it, it's a good basis for, uh, for inter entrepreneurship. All right. Uh, well, I think this is it because I see several questions that uh, keep coming, but we already covered. Yeah, about the Joint Japan scholarship, it's no longer available. That's why you're not being able to apply for the scholarship. Uh, well, you do have my email. I will post it again. Uh, I will also get back uh, to you all uh, with the recording uh, of this uh, webinar, also with the presentations of my colleagues. So uh, yeah, then you will have the open floor to get back to me with other questions that uh, remained unanswered. Um, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed. Uh, Enika, Hadil, Leonardo, Charlotte, thank you so much uh, for uh, your uh, presentations. Um, and thank you so much uh, for joining us as well from all the corners of the world. Uh, and I think this is it. Uh, have a good day and uh, we'll keep in touch. And hopefully you will apply for our master's programs. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.